Welcome. Thank you for joining us for a conversation about the Boston University School of Public Health. I'm Sandra Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean for the School of Public Health. At Boston University School of Public Health, we think that we have the extraordinary good fortune of working to change the world for a living. We know you're interested in joining us, and today we're going to have a conversation. I'm going to be talking to Associate Dean of Education, Lisa Sullivan, Associate Dean of Practice, Harold Cox, Associate Dean of Research, Mike McLean. What I thought I would do is talk a little bit with each of the deans about what they do. At the school, we have a core purpose. It's think, teach, do for the health of all. The idea behind that is that we think, which means we generate research and scholarship. We teach, which means we teach the next generation. And we do, we apply our ideas in practice in the real world. And Lisa, Harold, and Mike represent each of those axes, think, teach, and do. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over. I'll start with Mike. Mike, talk to us a little bit about research at the school. Well, I think, I think for us at the school, our, um, our research, and it all starts with the research environment that we're in. I mean, um, at Boston University, which is one of the largest private universities in the country, within Boston, Massachusetts, which is a, a leading center of health innovation in the world. And so within all of that, I mean, we have a, a, a really large and growing research portfolio, um, over $60 million a year. And it's in, um, it's pretty much all domains of public health. I mean, um, what we hear from our students is pretty much anything they might be interested in pursuing. We, we generally have an active research um, um, program in that content area. How do students engage with the research? Well, I mean, people, you know, students come to us with varying interests in, in how they might be involved in research. And one of the things that's always striking to me is that even for a student that's not interested in actively engaging in research while they're here, their time's gonna be affected by research while they're here. Because they're gonna be learning from our faculty the cutting edge methods of, of research and of doing public health that, that our faculty are using in their active research um, projects. And in, in terms of public health practice, that's closely tied to our research mission because we are doing research to solve real world problems. All of our research projects are designed to solve a real world public health problem and to come up with answers and solutions. So, you know, our, our, our students often can get involved in any step of that process. It can be all the way from initiating a new project, designing it, and trying to get funding to support it, being out in the field gathering data, um, analyzing data, presenting at conferences, and um, writing up papers for, uh, to, to communicate our results. Mm -hmm. Let me turn over to Lisa. Let's talk about the teach for a second. Lisa, mm -hmm. can you um, talk a little bit about the big picture? Talk a little bit about the full suite of educational programs that we have at the school. Sure. So we have programs running from high school programs all the way through mm -hmm. programs for lifelong learning. So our flagship program is the Masters of Public Health, and that is about 90% of our student body but we have other programs that attract students at the master's level, a new program in population health research for students who are more interested in research as opposed to practice. The MPH is very practically oriented. We also have doctoral programs in epidemiology and environmental health and health services research and in biostatistics and a DRPH program. And then beyond that, we have a suite of offerings for people interested in personal development or continuing professional education in our Office of Lifelong Learning. Can you um, talk a little bit about what makes you most excited about this educational program? How do you feel you've been in, uh, a leader in uh, public health education for a couple of decades? What do you think distinguishes us? So first, our MPH program is very practically oriented. Our students leave this program with the skills and they are ready to go and tackle the problems that exist today and into the future. Our research programs have been set up with specialization options that are in demand. So we are preparing people for the jobs that not only exist today, but it will exist in the years to come. Now, not to embarrass you for a second, but uh, can you go to those props for a second and uh, tell us about the two books that are over there? <laughs> You are embarrassing me, but uh, it's my there are two names on my this job. Book. <laughs> right, right. So this is Teaching Public Health, which uh, Dean Galea and I had the privilege of editing, and it came out last year. And I'm really excited about this book because there was no such thing like it before this uh, was published. And it includes contributions from leaders in education mm -hmm. from across the country and around the world. And um, 
we were fortunate enough to secure this contract to do this book and have heard very positive feedback about uh, the resource that it is for faculty teaching public health around the world. So um, it is an exciting project and I thank you for uh, you know, the partnership on it and uh, hopefully you know, lots of people will pick this up and use it. And the other book? And the other book. Mm. Could you hold my coffee cup? I'd be very <laughs> happy to do that. So this is Public Health, an introduction, an introduction to the science and practice of population health. And this is an exciting book that's actually a textbook for uh, students who are new to public health at the undergraduate and graduate level. And here, too, I don't think there is another resource like this book. I, again, had the opportunity to work with two um, incredible co-authors, Dean Galea and uh, James Schultz from Miami. And this book is a compilation of everything a student needs to know about population health. And uh, it will be hopefully appearing in classrooms starting this semester and into the future. Uh, and it's, it's really a, a tremendous resource. One of the things that I've been uh, proudest of is um, how we've been able to I think integrate our ideas, our ideas in terms of the think side of the house that uh, Dee McLean mentioned about what causes health in populations, how we can do something about it with how we teach our students. And, and I actually think that that is what a great school of public health should do. And I think mm -hmm. we've been able to build that kind of interconnectedness which, which distinguishes us and mm -hmm. it actually makes me happy. So let me talk about, let's switch to do now. Let's, let's switch to Dean, Dean Cox, Harold. Let's start local. Let's start with, uh, with our engagement in the practice world locally. We are located in the south end of Boston. Um, we, have a, we, we are on Albany Street and you have a Life on Albany Committee. Can you talk a little bit about how is it that we in our practice engage with the local community? Our community, our school is located um, in the middle of three communities. The south end, Dorchester, Roxbury, South Boston. Those communities are diverse in the people who live there, in incomes, in race, in many different kinds of ways. We are most directly in the South End, and there are a number of activities that we have that we are engaged in in the community, I'll identify two. One is the Life on Albany work. We have around us a number of homeless shelters and other services for individuals who are experiencing um, homeless issues and drug issues and the like. And, and we are involved with working with those populations. We have students who are uh, doing volunteer work with something called the Engagement Center, which is a, a, uh, a day program. We have students who are working with us and helping how do we understand who the population is, what do they need, and how do we engage with them. The second program we have is something at the Blackstone Community Center. Blackstone is a community center just a couple of blocks away from us, and our university runs a gym there. This is a program that is multi-generational, and mm -hmm. they serve kids through adults. We place students in that gym. We place students in a number of different activities so that they can learn more about who the population is, how to work with them, and engage with them in pretty meaningful ways. Now, go bigger picture. Tell us, what, what's the Activist Lab and, uh, and, and what's the vision for the Activist Lab's work? The Activist Lab is a really exciting project that we have here that we have now have in place for about the last five years. It's a project that allows us to do real world activism in our community. And what the Activist Lab does is identifies issues and then engages our students in those issues, our students, faculty, and staff. We have a number of projects, and certainly the Life on Albany project that I was just talking about is one of those activities, but we have something else called Activist Bucks that I wanted to speak about. It's my favorite project, as you know. It's my, my favorite <laughs> yeah. project, too. Uh, Activist Bucks allows us to, do, to give small innovation grants um, from a few dollars to up to about $2,500 to students to do projects in the local community. So a couple of examples. We have students, we had, we had a student who wanted to work in a community garden. And what she did is she bought materials for the community garden and then paid young people to actually be able to work in the community garden. We had young people, we had students who also wanted to uh, do work in the, um, the, the, the engagement center, which is the program for people who are 
living on the street, and they did a, a, a reading program. So every week they were going in and they were reading with students and, and individuals who were in the engagement center. We've had uh, a group of students who were interested in issues around elder concerns and they were playing bingo with the elders in one of the neighborhood centers and then did something called a, um, a senior prom, <laughs> which was an opportunity to bring a lot of old people like myself into <laughs> the, into the, to have a prom. It was fun. And so these projects allow our students to be, to do firsthand, real world work in the local community to address a particular need that's in the community. Let me take it up to one more level. Can you just talk about one project that um, the Activist Lab has worked on at the state or federal level? There have been, it's difficult always to think about just one, but, but we'll just pick just one. We don't have to call it your favorites. We can okay. just, just, just one. All right, just one. The, one of the projects that we have been working on is uh, in Massachusetts, we have a very complex set of, we deliver public health in a very complex way. There are 351 towns and cities and there are 351 health departments. That's not a really great way to actually run a health department. Mm -hmm. And we have been involved for a number of years in looking at what's a better way for us to design services in our state. We have had our students serving as activist fellows and being on the front hand of thinking about that, of being part of a committee that was uh, that was ordained by the governor and by the legislature. And so they were doing policy work, they were doing advocacy work, they were doing work that helped to think about what's the right way for hmm. us to design services in our state. That's pretty cool. It was great. Let's, let's, let's go to stories for a second. Let me go back sure. to uh, Mike, to Dean McLean. Mike, can you talk a little bit about um, your own work in Nicaragua? To, to tell us a little bit about uh, your research portfolio, because I think it, in many ways it represents really a, a lovely example of some of the excellent work that's done here. Sure, I think um, you know, one of the nice things about that project is like a lot of our projects, it involves faculty and students from many departments throughout the school. And I think that's, that's um, you know, a great example of how we do our research. It's really multidisciplinary, it requires people with lots of different complementary skill sets to come together to tackle difficult problems. That's actually, I think, one of the great things about public health. We have our students come to us every year with really diverse backgrounds. Everyone brings something different and unique to our community, and we need that diversity of experience and skills to come together and tackle complicated problems. And that's what we're facing in Nicaragua. Is um, you know, over the past 20 years, there's been this epidemic of chronic kidney disease um, in Central America, and and we don't really understand the cause. Um, when we first started to get involved at the school. Um, it wasn't even clear whether this was a disease that was environmentally related or occupationally related. The, the origins were really unknown. And as, as we've um, been working on it, we've been working closely with communities, governments, employers, um, other collaborators in the region. Another example of how important it is to bring stakeholders to the table. So not only lots of collaborators within our institution, but other institutions, and then in the regions where we work, making sure we bring all the relevant stakeholders together to, to solve a problem like this. Um, and we've, um, you know, as I said earlier, I mean, we do this work with the goal of having a real world impact. So we're trying to find what's causing this problem, not just to present it at a nice conference or write a journal article, which is important to do so that we can communicate our results. But we're doing it so that we can figure out what changes need to make com we need to make so that we can reduce or eliminate the risk of the disease. It's, um, I think the, the, the work that uh, you and your group have done in Nicaragua is really, uh, it really represents like a way of bridging a lot of, a, a lot of these areas that we're talking about. So it's got the do element because you've been very actively involved in advocacy informed by the results of your study. It's got the teach element, you've had students involved in it, and it's got the think element, because you've actually been answering an interesting and important question. Let me turn back to you, Lisa, to mm -hmm. uh, Dean Sullivan. So, a thought exercise. If you were a student and you're about to uh, come back to school, which of our programs would you enroll in? That's a tough question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a biostatistician and never had the opportunity to study public health. Um, but I've been teaching in our MPH program. Mm -hmm. I've had great fortune to teach our quantitative methods course, which is broader than biostatistics, so it's been a great learning experience. So I don't know. The, I, would, I think I would like the MPH because I love all of the different areas that are part of the MPH, whereas my 
own training was um, much more narrowly defined. I'm also excited about our new Master of Science programs in population health research. Um, I can certainly relate a bit more to the research side of it, but the focus on climate and health, uh, translation implementation science, global health, epidemiology, I actually would have a hard time choosing one of those <laughs> options, but either the MPH or, or one of those, I think I would probably gravitate towards. I think you definitely want to do a degree in epidemiology. <laughs> it's, really, it's the only way to go. Um, uh, Harold, can you um, go back to uh, Dean Cox and talk about Duke? Sure. You, um, have a side gig, apart from being our uh, dean of uh, practice, you're also a storyteller. Mm. And um, I, I'm not going to ask you to tell us a story, okay. although that's kind of fun. But um, w why do you think storytelling matters? Well, w why did, and I know it's something that you do on the side, but uh, in our conversations, I've been struck by how much you think storytelling matters to your day job. I think, well, first of all, we know that public health is a discipline about doing things. And in many times when we're thinking about the work that we do in public health, we need to convey to the public um, emphasis about things that we want them to do to improve the health, things that we want them to change, uh, new policies that we want to put in place. And I think the best way of being able to do that is to be able to tell the story. The kind of work that Mike does of translating that information that he does about his work in Nicaragua and many other places is best told through telling a story. So storytelling is the vehicle for being able to make our work alive and it makes it, it takes the numbers, it takes the information that we have and it makes it real. It makes it so that people can understand it and that it's approachable. So I think that while my storytelling world is a, is a wonderful sideline thing, it is very applicable to the work that I do here in public health. Yeah, I, I, and not only does that make a lot of sense, it ties in, I think, with quite a few things that we do at the school. We do, we do these signature programs, which are quite frequent, but a couple, two to three times a month, where we bring in experts from all over the world to talk about the key topics of consequence of public health, from Ebola to vaping. And, uh, we have a, we're calling these public health conversations. They really are about conversations that help change how we understand public health and how we think about public health. Now let's, let's turn the tables. Sure. Why don't you all ask me questions? Hmm. Now's your chance. On camera, you can ask me anything you want. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Harold, come on, you have a question. Sure. Um, Sandra, where do you want our school to be in the next five years? Oh, that's a great question. I, uh, I came to the school five years ago because I was really motivated by its mission, by, 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 by the heart under the school. The school has always been an excellent school of public health motivated by social justice mission. And that is actually unusual. It's an unusual combination. And I think what we've done in the past five years has been to help hone that, to say the health of the public is what we do collectively, what we do together to create a better world. That's what we do. And you cannot do that without focusing on the preventive conditions that cause health. You cannot do that without focusing on safe housing, good schools, gender equity, livable wages, clean air, drinkable water. And we have built a school that understands that and where we do excellent scholarship, outstanding teaching, and are involved in the world of practice towards that goal. The next five years, I see us deepening that. I see us deepening that and sharpening that. And I think the educational programs, the suite of educational programs that um, Dean Sullivan talked about are really different ways of teaching students, of providing the opportunity for students to learn that, to become agents of the change themselves. I think the scholarship our faculty, uh, our faculty do is a way of us changing how we think, changing the data we have, and changing the public conversation. I think the work that you've been doing through the Activist Lab is an opportunity to create a translational pathway for those ideas and for our students to engage with to creating a better world. So I am deeply motivated by the idea of being in a position to create knowledge, teach it to the next generation, and make the world a better place. That's a pretty, um, that's a pretty rare privilege, and I want to see us do more of that. Can I take that a step further? Please. Uh, so you asked me a question a moment ago about storytelling yeah. yes. and about the importance of storytelling. You are internationally known and are in travel around making many speeches, sharing your expertise with many people. 
what are the skills that you think are important for a new person hmm. coming into the field to be able to do the kind of thing that you do? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, I think we want to make sure that anyone coming into the field, any new student to public health, has an excellent grounding in the foundations of public health and the intellectual flexibility to carve out a path for themselves as the needs of public health evolve. Because the needs of public health 20 years from now are going to be different than they are today, and 40 years from now are going to be different than they are 20 years from now. And frankly, I don't know what they are going to be 20 years from now. So when you look back at what we've done with our MPH, for example, we have restructured our MPH to reflect just that. There is a common core where we say, everyone who graduates needs to know these things. That says, an investment in knowing the foundations well. But then beyond that, students have flexibility to choose among 16 interdisciplinary certificates, which means you can make your own path. And that's the balance we've been trying to strike. So I think a, a new student in public health needs to understand the basics, be excellent at the basics, and then have the dexterity to choose their own interesting intellectual path. Could I sort of jump on that one? Yeah, please. So you spend a lot of time with students. They have lunch with you. They have conversations over mm. coffee with you. Um, what has been the most surprising thing mm. about the students here at Boston University? Because you've been at other yes. institutions. And in your view, what should our student body look like in the future? What, yeah. what kinds of students should we be recruiting um, to train who will make the biggest impact when they leave here? Yeah, it's an, it's a, it's an excellent question. Um, let, me, let me start by answering the first question. I, I have been, I'm not sure surprised is the right word, but I have been struck by how deeply passionate our students are about doing the right thing by the world. And, and uh, sometimes I've used the, the word, our students are true believers. And, I, and I, I couldn't say that from a place of deeper respect because I consider myself a true believer. And, uh, I consider myself having been many decades now in the professional world, I've never grown cynical about the mission of public health to actually make the world a better place. It's, I believe that's what we're here for. And our students believe that. And mm -hmm. every time I talk to them, I'm struck by the fact that um, we are fortunate to have in our midst students who see their mission of creating the world and making the world a little bit healthier. And that's pretty unique. And frankly, mm -hmm. if one can have a purpose-driven life that way, that is pretty special. So that's what strikes me about our students. Now, in terms of how one weaves that into a set of programs and uh, how one looks forward, I, I, I think that um, we want to help students then find the space to do that. And we want to do that by generating inclusive excellence, by having excellence in our students and making sure that we have in our midst students of all stripes. We want our students to represent the world that we are going to serve, because the world we're going to serve will not be well served by having only students of one type. We want mm -hmm. students from all over the world, we have students from all over the world, and we want students of all dimensions. And we make a big effort to build a, a diverse and inclusive community, and that, mm -hmm. frankly, is a wonderful place to be. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. place to study, and it's a wonderful place to work. Mm -hmm. I'm always struck that I think in the, you know, people find their way to public health over mm. time in a way that's a bit different from other fields. You know, there aren't, I think it's a very small number of us that just grew up always knowing we wanted to be in the field of public health. We yes. more or less find our way to public health. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's a great feature of public health because, I mean, I think that's maybe in part why we have such a passionate um, community, you know, it's because people are here because they want to be here. They, they maybe started out studying something else that was complementary, maybe on the fringes, and then found that this was actually their passion. I mean, that was, that was my experience. I started out a math major, you know, no offense, but... <laughs> <laughs> then you do <laughs> the the list. <laughs> <laughs> But that wasn't quite for me. You should do a degree <laughs> in epidemiology as well. Yeah. <laughs> <It's a laughs> And then I studied <laughs> environmental science, which was, you know, more birds and trees, which are also important, but, you know, wasn't exactly where I found my way to environmental health, which for me was a good fit, and that, that brought me to public health. So I know, I know for you, you know, you've, you um, traveled a similar path, started out as a physician. I did. Um, what, what led you to find your way to public health from a path that didn't start out that way? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I'm often asked by students about if they should follow my path. My answer is no, because my path was very windy and uh, roundabout. And I, I, I was a case study for what you just said. I, I didn't really know about public health, and I was a physician. And um, the truth is, the moment when I, I, I realized I needed to go to public health was I was working as a physician. I happened to be working in Somalia at, um, at the time with uh, Doctors Without Borders. And I was doing a lot of good I, I, as a physician. I was helping people on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, I, I realized that while I was doing a lot of good, I, it was short-term good. And I realized that uh, it was important. It was important. But once I left, nothing was really going to change. And I started asking myself, well, what really is going to make a difference here. And the, the, the um, metaphor that came to mind was pulling people out of a river. You know, standing aside a river, people were drowning. I was jumping in, saving one person, saving another person, saving another person. And I was never asking, well, what's throwing them in the river to begin with? What's upstream? And that's when I realized I needed to learn public health. So I went back to school to do an MPH to learn public health. And I didn't know at the time that I was, it was going, then going to become my professional life, essentially my second career. Uh, but it was eye-opening for me. It was a revelation. I thought, this is what I want to do. I want to figure out how to make people healthy. And to make people healthy, it is these preventive conditions of health that we need to invest in, we need to understand. It is safe housing, it's good schools, it's livable wages, it's clean air, drinkable water, it's a fair economy. These are all the forces that generate public health. And I have found the intellectual breadth that that affords and coupled with then practicality, with the sort of very real practicality of creating a healthier world, truly compelling. Harold, maybe you can comment on this a little bit. So Harold, you, you served as the health officer for a large town, for Cambridge, for many years before you took this position. Can you comment a little bit about how what we're talking about here actually works in the real world and, and, and how you've navigated back and forth between the world of public health practice and the world of academic public health? So my work in, uh, as you talk about this windy road about where people come from, I certainly had a windy road as well. I was trained as a social worker and mm -hmm. started working initially with individuals who have developmental disabilities and, and then people who have HIV and, and then worked with, uh, with, the, with the town of, of Cambridge where I worked for a long time. I, I think the thing that I learned is that it's always changing. Mm -hmm. The world is, there's always a new thing that is, that is happening. That either we're talking, we, at the time that I was working there, we were either dealing with issues around tobacco, or we were dealing with West Nile virus, or we were dealing with anthrax, or we were dealing with a number of other kinds of concerns, or just thinking about the health of black men. Those were all things that we were thinking about at one point or the other. And what I found was that there were a set of skills that I needed to have in order to be able to address those kinds of things. So when I think about education and think about practice, what public health education provides is a broad set of skills that allowed me and others to be able to move in and out of a number of different issues. We are today listening and hearing about the disease that is coming out of China and the concerns that that's actually raising. Mm -hmm. It's important then that the set of skills that our students are able to learn here and in other public health settings will allow them to be able to be malleable, will allow them to be flexible, allow them to be able to address a number of different kinds of concerns. So my work as a practitioner in Cambridge and other places that I work has been able to be enhanced by what I know about public health. I, Lisa, I actually study epi a little bit. <laughs> but. Uh, but just a little bit. And so it's important then that I understand those skills. It's important that I understand how to read the research. It's important that I understand how policy is made. It's important that I understand how you think about uh, doing administration in a program of services. Those are all the kinds of things that people in public health are doing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important that public health education then gives you the skill to actually be able to do a number of different kinds of things. It certainly worked for me. So let me, uh, I want to end with uh, talk about memories for a second. So, so I, I, I want a favorite memory. I want a favorite memory hmm. of the past few years about anything, um, anything at the school. 
Well, my, my favorite, yeah. I have many things that yeah. um, oh, I have the opportunity to do in members. my job. Multiple members. Yeah, but I have to say what well, my favorite is teaching. Mm -hmm. um, I love being in the classroom. I love working with students. And uh, I've had the privilege to have students in the class. It doesn't, this doesn't start off well, but it ends well. Okay, good. Um, they, they struggle at the beginning in quantitative mm -hmm. methods. It's mm -hmm. not for everybody, right, Mike? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so they might be anxious at the beginning, but uh, they get through it realizing that they need to know this information mm -hmm. to be able to do the things that they really want to do. They have to understand how to interpret data, use data. Um, and so my best memories, and there are several, are when students completely turn around and at the end really get it and actually sometimes choose to be epidemiologists or biostatisticians mm -hmm. when they certainly did not start that way. <laughs> I think my memory, and I, I maybe have two memories, one of them is what happens when students come here at orientation. It's always interesting to me to see a brand new group of people who come in, and they come from many different places. Some are straight out of undergraduate school, some have a few years of work under their belt, some have a lot of years of work under their belt, but they come in excited and scared not quite sure what they are going to experience and interested in doing something. And then on the other part of that is seeing them when they graduate, when they walk across the stage assured about what it is that they've been able to do here. So that's one memory. The second memory is when you came. <laughs> I, I think that it was a really wonderful time to actually see the energy that you brought to the school the kinds of things that you challenged all of us to think about, the kinds of conversations that you and I had, and most importantly, the kind of conversations that you were having with many other people. So thank you for that memory. Thank you, that's very nice. <laughs> Mike. Um, well, um, one of my favorite things is when I'm checking my news feed on the train on the way into work and I'm, I'm, I'm reading some new, new headlines about some new study and I find that it's us. You know, that it's some, a member of our faculty published a study and I'm reading about it in the New York Times or the Boston Globe or NPR and it happens a lot. And, I, and, and that for me is not so much about, you know, seeing the name of our school in the news, but it means that we're doing work that matters. You know, if we were doing stuff that people didn't care about, it wouldn't end up you know, on the front page of the New York Times, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that for me is always a signal that we're on the right track, that we're tackling um, the most important problems um, in public health and, and that there are things the world needs and things the world care about, cares about and that's why they're getting the attention. That's cool. Well, I'm, uh, I'm going to use Dean's prerogative to talk about three memories. Um, uh, as I, uh, everybody knows, I, my favorite day of the year, I've been very public about this, is always our uh, commencement. I actually love, I love commencement. I love the energy. I love seeing, as Harold, you said, the students now no longer students now they're alums and they, they they have clarity about what they're going to do and they stride with purpose and I have the enormous privilege of handing them their diplomas and uh, it, it actually even just talking about it I get sort of tingly it's a I just love the day we always have an inspirational um, uh, commencement speaker Harold you you say amazing things it's a, so I love that it's my favorite day of the year my second favorite day of the year is um, orientation I, I actually uh, getting new students who are who, as we discussed, through a windy path, have drifted to public health and uh, are wondering what this public health thing is. And I have the privilege of doing the first lecture. And every year, I do an hour and a half, the first lecture. And um, it, it is, hands down, the lecture I enjoy giving most every year because it's actually a real responsibility. I, I, I think it's a big responsibility. I'm sort of trying to do an introduction to what this public health thing is. And uh, I want to make sure I... I don't screw it up, as you would say. I'm trying to make sure I get it right. So I really enjoy doing that. And my third uh, favorite memory is um, more variable. I feel like every year we do one event that stands out in my mind, that stays with me. We do a lot of events. We do a lot of uh, conversations at the school. And this year, it was the one that Harold, you organized, which was our 400 Years of Inequality Symposium, where we arranged a symposium to mark the 400 uh, anniversary of the first slaves being sold in the bondage in Jamestown. And um, we had an outstanding array of speakers from uh, activists to academics to community members. And um, 
I just thought it was a really powerful day. And then um, you followed it up by having um, spoken word art, and it was really incredible. I just thought it was just a fantastic conversation to, uh, to have in our community. And every year, I feel like we have an event like that. And you know, it varies. I mean, this year it was that one. We had outstanding symposium on statistics. And uh, it's, uh, I, I feel like these events really shape my thinking. So those are sort of three mm -hmm. of my memories. So let's conclude. I um, want to say thank you for joining us. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Dean McLean, Dean Cox, and Dean Sullivan. Thank you, everybody who's listening. Thank you for joining us. And um, it is an invitation to follow up, follow up with us. You can ask our admissions team anything. Uh, at asksph at bu.edu, that's A-S-K-S-P-H at bu.edu. Come to one of our information sessions, attend our Acceptance Students Day. You can find details of all these on our website. In truth, all of us are actually quite findable. You can actually Google all of us, you can contact all of us, and one of the uh, things that we pride ourselves in is that we are available. We're available to prospective students, we're available to students. But look at our website, talk to our admissions team. We'd really very much love to meet you. Thank you for joining us.